uh, taking part in his first NBA Finals as a commissioner after a full season of being commissioner of the NBA. He is Adam Silver joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. Commissioner, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Rich. Great to be on. Yeah, thank you for coming on. So what have you been up to this last week with no NBA to watch? You know, I'm just catching up on things. <laughs> it was nice that there were a few nights where – I wasn't watching TV till 1.30 in the morning or so. I'm, I'm sympathetic to fans on the East Coast, but uh, just catching up on life. But uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to these finals. Well, is there any possibility of maybe in the future? I understand, look, you, you'd like to have uh, the good fortune that the NHL had with the conference finals with two game sevens. Uh, of if something does happen like this in the future, you calling up uh, the good folks at Disney and saying, how about let's move, some, uh, let's move a date up. Let's not just stick to a hard and fast date. Has that ever been considered? You know, so a couple of things. You know, truth be told, we did have that conversation about potentially moving up. And, you know, Susie would know this. That <laughs> some, some years ago, we used to have a built-in move-up. If mm -hmm. both conference final series didn't go longer than five games, we would have moved up two days. So under that scenario, we would have started tonight rather than Thursday night. So when certainly when the East finished – and then we saw that there was a chance that the West could finish with, with five games or fewer. We had that discussion. So one, you know, for, for Disney, ABC slash ESPN, it is difficult to move on short notice given they have other scheduled programming. But it wasn't just a ABC issue. I mean, then, as you know, we're broadcast in over 200 countries. So mm -hmm. then we're dealing with broadcasters all around the world who have preset broadcast windows. So it then creates enormous issues for them. On top of that, we have roughly a thousand credentialed media who come to the finals, many of them coming from outside the United States who, well, of course, they don't know exactly what city they're going to be in. They fly into New York or L.A., depending where they're coming from, and then fly from there. And then there's the hotels and other issues. So, you know, ultimately, there was a reason why we locked in the date and we decided to stick by it. And, and lastly, I'll say, especially when there's no doubt there's some players that will be benefited from the rest, I'm, I'm always reluctant mid-course to change a rule. And so everyone knew going into these play playoffs, all the teams, exactly when the finals would start. They knew if their conference final series ended earlier, they would have that met much rest coming up. So it just it felt strange, even though we had the conversation with ABC and ESPN and said, if we wanted to, could we? We, look, we talked to the buildings to see if they were available. But ultimately, we decided this, we had made this decision a few years ago to lock it in. Let's stick with it. And, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it, it will lead to better competition because both players on both teams need the rest. How much during the playoffs are you involved with the officiating? And by that, I mean this, the, the concept of flagrant ones and flagrant twos and what happened with Al Horford after what happened uh, with Della Vadova and Corver and what was going on with Dwight Howard the next night with Bogut and how uh, fans can look at it and say one is more flagrant than the other and the refs looked at it differently and then it's up to the league office to perhaps do it. Uh, a, a post-mortem on it. How, how much are you involved in that process, Commissioner? You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly involved. I'm mainly involved from a process standpoint. Um, as you know, Rod Thorne you know, oversees basketball operations at the league. You know, he's, he's been with the league. You know, I think when you include the time as a player of 50 years, you know, as having been a general manager, a coach, longtime league executive. And, and so ultimately it's Rod's job with the assistance of Kiki Vanderway to then – take a fresh look at whatever that ruling was on the floor. I, I get very involved from a process standpoint because I want to ensure there's consistency. I want to ensure we're approaching it the right way. I want to, and, and it, as you said, this is my first full season as commissioner. Mm -hmm. And it's also there, there are several things that, that we've all changed since I've become commissioner, just you know, largely to try to make it more transparent to fans in terms of exactly what we're going through, our replay center, our acknowledgement of when calls are wrong. And so, you know, I, I mean, certainly Rod reviews everything with me, but ultimately, ultimately, I mean, at least in all of these cases, I've been very deferential to Rod in terms of what his ultimate view is, if something should be upgraded from a foul to a flagrant one or whether it's a flagrant two or flagrant one. I'll just add that, you know, in the day and age of a replay center, sort of in the old days, not so long ago, when we were looking at those reviews, ultimately it was the ben with the benefit of angles that officials didn't see on the floor. In many cases, they didn't see any replay at all, and they were making those calls live. Now, with our replay center in Secaucus, New Jersey, the officials plus others, management people in the replay center, are all looking at, are looking at all the angles that are available. So 
what Rod now has the benefit of when he's looking at calls the next day are interviews that we've done with players. So often when you're looking at a replay and you can't tell from the replay, even as many angles as we have, if, for example, an elbow actually made contact with a player's head, that often in the post-game interviews, players will acknowledge that they'll say, both players will say, yes, I hit him, or both players will say, no, he, he didn't make contact with his elbow. So that's really when Rod's making decisions the next day, he potentially has information or that, that the officials did not have or the people in the replay center did not have at the time the calls were being made. Well, we're also seeing, Commissioner, a lot of replays take place at crucial moments and final seconds of the game when other teams don't have a timeout and these replays are giving them the benefit of one. Uh, and a lot of people are having issues with replay just from that standpoint. How do you feel replay is going in the NBA right I, now? I think on balance it's going really well, and and there is that you, you could argue that is an unintended consequence of giving a timeout to a team that doesn't merit one at that moment. I think there's also just the stoppage in play, which you know the fan in me doesn't like that, and I and I understand fans are saying you know this is a game of of flow, and we don't want to see those long stoppages, especially when it seems like. You know, the officials who are determined to get it right, working with the people in the replay center, are looking at certain plays over and over again because even with the benefit of all those angles, it's hard to tell. But I, I think it's one of those issues that you, it's, in, in context, looking at the balancing of all the different factors, we're far better off having replay. That at the end of the day, even if it leads to some stoppage in play that you would otherwise not like, even if it leads to an unintended timeout for a team, that ultimately – you know, faced with the prospect as we had in the old days of watching that play run endlessly over and over again on Sports Center and other highlight shows, and for the whole world to see that the officials were fooled or flat out wrong on the floor, I think we'd rather get it right. You know, have, having said that, Rich, I mean, we're always looking to improve it. The replay center has made a huge difference. Um, this year, we've cut with the replay center, we've cut the time, the average time for a, a, re, a replay review on the floor in half. So it's the, the average time is roughly 40 seconds now. So, you know, down significantly from, from last year. So, and, and I'm sure we're going to continue to improve it over the years. Uh, Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, calling me here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. What is the temperature, uh, commissioner, about changing the rules in hacking a player because he's a poor free throw shooter and just grabbing him around the waist when he is just mere steps down the floor? It is, it's unwatchable, I've got to say, as a fan of the sport that you know that I am. It's just very difficult to see not only the game stopped, but then to have somebody uh, struggle at the free throw line. Is there, is there any temperature to change this rule in the offseason? You know, I, I would say that the temperature is not as high as I thought it would be going into a meeting with GMs, which we had two weeks ago in Chicago. Um, you know, from a fan standpoint, I'm with you. It you know can be like watching paint dry. It can be tough. Although I will say, and I've and I've learned this. I said this before that, you know, often the data can prove our, our gut reactions wrong. And in this case, at least so far, you know, as you know, with Nielsen ratings, you can look at minute by minute ratings of telecasts. People are not tuning out. You know, when when hack a shack happens. But having said that. You know, once again, I mean, it's an issue here for, from, from the league office. One, it largely involves two teams, Houston, and, uh, the Rockets, and the Clippers. Mm -hmm. You know, and on those two teams, it's largely about two players, Dwight Howard and DeAndre Jordan. And sort of I also have a larger obligation to the game in, in my role here as commissioner. And, uh, you know, again, as I've said before, I get hundreds of emails from high school coaches, AAU coaches, saying you can't possibly change the rule to benefit people who – players, and especially just a few players, high-profile players who can't shoot free throws. And so I, I'm a bit torn. I, I, look, and you know, I've heard Jeff Van Gundy on air say, well, the league's completely inconsistent because on one hand, they're saying guys should make their free throws. On the other hand, we did change the rule for the last two minutes of the game. And one, once again, I, I, I acknowledge there's an inconsistency there, and it, we were trying to compromise. We were saying it's, it's not great from a viewer standpoint, so for the last two minutes of the game, when it was being used more, you know, more prevalently in the past, you know, we changed the rules so you could not put those guys on the line if it was a foul away from the ball. I think now it's it's. I actually think from a, given that I'm torn on it, I think where I come out is let's look at one more season of data because the other issue in a lot of those high-profile games where it was used this year, especially in the playoffs, the team that used it 
didn't win the game. It ultimately wasn't effective. Because remember, if, if, you know, ultimately for it to be effective, the guy you're putting on the line, essentially analytics show, has to be roughly less than a 50% free throw shooter. So it's really for those high profile players to get, who play a lot of minutes to get their free throw percentages up to roughly 50%. It's no longer an effective strategy. Well, well, so I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against, I'm not you know, morally against changing it. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm cognizant that ultimately that we're an entertainment product and you know, we've got to keep fans engaged and interested in the game. But I'd but I like to look at a little bit more data before, before I push to change the rule in the league. Well, you know, Commissioner, the NFL has a, has a, a fund that owners put money into to help uh, build facilities and stadiums. Maybe Maybe there's a fund that you can have ownership put in to help build better free throw shooters. You know, what do you think of that idea? Throw that out there. You know, too, uh, you know, nothing wrong with basketball academies. In all seriousness, yeah, sure. you know, it's something. You know, IMG has a, has an academy. Um, we're developing a program with Yao in China. And and you know, the one thing about free throws, I think they're talking especially to players in the league. It's, and and Chris Weber told a story on TNT one night how. You know, his rookie season, he was a low 50-some-odd percentage free-throw shooter, and he made a decision that he was going to improve. And over the course of the offseason, I mean, he told a story about how he traveled with his shooting coach everywhere he went. That summer, he was like, uh, he was on vacation somewhere, he went to somebody's wedding, that, sh- that shooting coach went with him everywhere. You know, he spent however many hours a day, and he was a 70-some-odd percent free-throw shooter his second year in the league. So, I, but I'm sympathetic. I mean, I don't mean to suggest that sure. these guys, you know, Dwight Howard, DeAndre Jordan, these are incredibly hardworking players. They're incredibly gifted athletes, you know, but, but I do think it would be odd, you know, especially when you're only dealing with a, with a, a very few players and just a couple of teams to, to then go ahead and say, we need to change the rule for these guys, especially a rule that's been in effect all these years. Last question for you, Commissioner. Have you at all reached out to Stephen Curry or the Warriors about him bringing his daughter to a post-game press conference afterwards? I, I haven't, and, and, and I haven't been bothered by it. I mean, I recognize that, you know, you've been a fan of the sport for a long time. Sure. I mean, it's happened occasionally. We can all have images in our head of certain players who've had their kids with them occasionally. I mean, I, I, I understand, too, the media is there to do a job. I think if Steph weren't cooperative, if he weren't answering questions, maybe it would be something I'd step in to do. But I, it, it, it to me, it doesn't rise to the level at all that the commissioner's office should be getting involved. Obviously, I'll be out in Oakland on Thursday night, and I'll see for myself. But I, so far, I mean, I, he's such a wonderful guy. He's a great family man. He does everything that is asked of him on and off the court. So for now, I, I don't see an issue with it at all. Has, has the league received any official complaints from any members of the media or media groups? Not, not that I'm aware of. None that have come to me. Okay. I mean, we, ha- you know, as you know, we have a lot of credentialed members of the media. I don't sure. know if there's, but, but as far as I know, nobody's complained to. Yeah, them. there are many sports journalists out there covering the sport, Commissioner. I know. So, uh, hey, listen, uh, I really appreciate you calling in. You are really one of uh, one of my favorites, as as you know. Thank and, you. And and um, and enjoy enjoy the finals. I, I really am enjoying it. It's it's. Uh, just watching the game, it's it's a it's a lot. Obviously, the game inside out usually gets played. Right now, it's being played outside in. It's a, just a really fascinating uh, uh, display of basketball with Curry and LeBron and what these two teams represent. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, no, this this, this series is, you know, is the best our game has to offer. So uh, you know, as I said, also as the fan in me, I mean, I can't wait till the final start. So. I'm thrilled. And please say hello to Susie for me. Uh, you just did. I mean, she might be out there right now. Commissioner, thanks for calling. Right. Appreciate it. Uh, it's Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern. On Audience.